going, and here's Owen. So by the way, I, um, I want to make sure that I cover things that people are interested in. So maybe we can flip this a little bit before, you can, I can tell you about myself, whatever, that's like 30 seconds. And then, but um, what are some of the topics that you'd love to sort of cover before we get to the pitches? Because really the pitches, you know, I want to give feedback and I want to try to be as constructive and helpful and sort of give you some insight into how at least I think about things. Um, in terms of looking at businesses. But before we get there, what are some of the topics that would be good to cover sort of as I'm sort of talking through my background and a little bit about history? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. What industry sectors will currently We'll definitely get to that. Anybody else? Yeah? Best practices for seed fundraising. Okay. Which round you investing in startups? What round? Okay. IP protection, yeah. Channel sales model. Channel sales model. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Scalability. Scalability. How do how do you discuss valuation of IP uh -huh. and, uh, investors when you are super early startup? Right. And you don't want to value it, but they want. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Anybody final? So I just want to tell you that I was lucky enough to be at the. Not, maybe not the first, but maybe the third or the fourth ERA routing. Um, and it didn't look like this, I promise you. It was in a cramped little conference room with maybe 10 people uh, around the table. And it was super informal. And Murat at the time took that, literally, those weekly meetings or monthly meetings, and turned it into sort of the ERA accelerator which now has how many companies after at this point? 165 funded companies, 13, 15, 17 classes, um, and many, many, many years later. And so it really is awesome for me to be here on the 10th anniversary because I literally, though I didn't see it the first one, I saw it maybe the third one. And uh, it's pretty great to have seen sort of all of it blossom. My 30 seconds on my background is I was an entrepreneur for three companies, uh, all relatively technical, uh, all in New York. And then in 2000, somewhere around 2006 or 7, I decided that there was this big gap in the market. And that big gap had to do with that there weren't sort of very rigorous and super formal venture investors at this sort of early stage, at the sort of, what we call the pre, the, the sort of pre-seed or seed stage. But don't forget, that's a very sort of modern term. That's only in the last, you know, sort of little while that seed actually existed as a layer of capital. And so if you think about it, it was like there were a bunch of angel investors and you tried to get everything going and then you got your series A. And there was literally nothing in between. And so, Part of what I felt very compelled to do is there are all of these great entrepreneurs in New York. And don't forget, this is post.com, and this is sort of like there was a giant sort of like crash of all the money, and it really dried up. And there were amazing entrepreneurs that really had almost no place to go in terms of angel capital and real rigorous capital where people would work with them and take a board seat and sort of really get involved. And so that was the beginning of what I started at the time, which was called NYC Seed, and that was 2008 or so. And we were, I was lucky enough to be able to pull a small fund together, and we ended up doing, I think, 50 plus deals. Um, and the portfolio turned into a really great portfolio, and it's not over. There's still plenty of really great companies in it. Um, and then about a couple of years ago, I joined a fund called Contour Ventures, um, and Contour focuses very much on enterprise and B2B, which is my background. And uh, we really look hard at trying to be, nothing's too early, um, definitely things are too late, um, but we, you know, we're definitely pre-Series A. We almost never do a Series A, very, very, very rarely, but primarily in the spot between you're a couple of guys or girls or women or men, and you are working on 
some very interesting technology, most likely in enterprise B2B, like SaaS B2B. You know, we, I'm not good at choosing and working with consumer-oriented companies, per se. I don't think I can be that helpful. I can probably be a little bit helpful. But, you know, I can be more helpful with deep tech, thinking about channel, thinking about sort of all of those things, IP, that go into, you know, very hardcore technology companies. And so, just to give you an example, you know, one of the sort of most recent uh, investments that I made was a company in the IoT security space. And what's interesting about it is, you know, not IOC to security per se, but their take on it, and their ability to look and say, hey, you know, you've got thousands of devices, maybe in a hospital, or in a, cons in a convention center, or in a hotel, how do you actually do it, and secure those devices where you can do it sort of all at once, right, at the network level? And with machine learning, and with sort of like fingerprinting, and all sorts of other things, that's the kind of, uh, sort of company that I get involved with and work with and try to help build and you know that that's really sort of directionally where where my head is at and I'm interested in a lot of different areas um, and you know nothing is sort of maybe a couple of things are too wacky uh, we looked at a I looked at a quantum computing team um, out of uh, out of Westchester one of the few in the in the country that actually can build a quantum computer and. That may be a little bit too, 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 but I would at least consider it. Um, so, with that said, um, I do want to sort of like try to address maybe some of the topics that people uh, brought up. So, let's talk about IP for a second. A couple people mentioned IP. How do you protect it? How do you value it? Um, sort of what is it? What's it worth? You know, IP. You know, I think having a patent means sort of that's table stakes. That doesn't guarantee success, nor does it mean that you're actually, people aren't gonna sort of get around your patent in any way. So I think what you need to really focus on as you know, you get credit for being a, a startup because of the package, right? And whether you have protected IP or not on day one, um, that's only a small part of sort of the, the, the puzzle. Like the reason why companies are valued in the early days, what they are is because it's a phenomenon when a couple of people get together, look and develop something that is unique to a particular market, and then are able to take that and go and run with it and be committed to it and have the right skill set to do so. That's actually the most important sort of part of the whole package, right? IP matters, right? Can you, you know, hopefully you didn't steal it or whatever, but it's not like, oh, I have a patent, you should pay me a billion dollars. Companies with, with, without patents are valuable. Companies with patents are valuable. Companies that only have patents and no founder or founder that can operate it or have commercial sense or anything else are really not that valuable, right? Um, let's see, what were some other sort of topics that I wanted to cover? Um, we do seed, obviously. Um, so if you think about what are some of the value, somebody asked about how do you think about value and value creation, I think that was you, right? Value, really, if you want to think about it is, do you have a very sustainable, differentiated product in the market? And can you sustain it, right? So have you come up with something unique? I was talking with a company today where it was a really good team in a really interesting area, and yet, there are, and they are executing really well, and they have three or four really big customers, right? Not marquee, but like big enough, right? Ticket sizes, you know, decent size sort of, sort of design deals. And yet, when we got to sort of the differentiation question, they really had nothing particularly sort of to answer around how they're different from almost any of the other three or four really good smart startups in the space that are also working on the same problem. And if you don't have a crystal clear answer around that, it will be very difficult for you, right? Let me give you an example. So I go to Abu Dhabi, uh, somewhat, somewhat um, often I teach, uh, one of the places that I teach at is at NYU, and NYU has a campus in Abu Dhabi, and I sometimes do boot camps there. 
And I went to Abu Dhabi and I, I flew to Doha one just one afternoon because it's very close. Um, and I went to this this market. And the market is the the, the big market in in Doha. And this thing that I noticed was that there were sections of types of stores. And each of those stores or stalls had identical products. And if you think about what that means, what do you think the pricing was between each of those stalls? Zero, almost zero difference, right? Between each of them. And that level, lack of differentiation, and you think that one of those people in the housewares or in the you know nuts and raisins or in the you know whatever it was blankets right would say to themselves wait a second I'm going to have totally differentiated products that are going to be completely different from my from my competitors so back to creating value what you really want to do is you want to have no competitors at all that's what you really ideally hope for and if you can achieve that it means that you're so differentiated right that you're so unique that actually Right? There's real value creation that's possible in the medium and longer term. In your product, it's so good, it's so hard, it's actually, the bar is so high that it's actually, it's too difficult to replicate by almost anybody else. Now, it's not gonna be complete at 100%, but that is how differentiated competitive products work. Okay. Any, I'll take one more, maybe, uh, a, a question or two, uh, and then let's just go to pitches. Well, even on the back of say, you can look at it, see, or see, you know, oftentimes, you know, in terms of uh, selling part of your company or raising that money, how do you even come to a, a realistic valuation number? Don't worry about valuation. Like somebody, if you're, if you're involved with, with um, there's a market for startups. It just exists, right? And the market range really doesn't vary between startups that much. It does to it. If, if you're a multiple, multiple founder and a blah, 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 and whatever, okay, fine, you're, you're sort of way out. But if you're in, in, you know, you're a team, you're starting a company, it's an interesting space, you have a unique product, you have a good skill set between the team, there is a range that investors will discuss with you about that they're willing to, pay you as take a percentage of your company. And so I wouldn't worry about valuation. I worry about everything else. I worry about how great of a product is. I worry how big the market is, right? I worry about your other competitors. I worry about your other partners. I worry about, you know, all of the things that actually matter, right? The valuation doesn't matter that much. That's an outcome of everything else. Yeah? What do you like about being a VC versus being an entrepreneur? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I'm definitely, a better, I can. I am more useful to people by being having been an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. like because I really truly know the pain, so much pain that I lived through, and the deep and being helpful is about actually being very specific and detailed, not broad in general, because being and having that level of sort of detail specificity means that I hopefully can be helpful in many 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 different areas that when they come up. And so being, you know, it's very challenging because you actually need to get up to speed super quickly. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a little bit, it, you know, it, it really does take a lot of effort to make sure that you are not being stupid and you didn't miss a whole sort of like aspect of a market or it's just what somebody is working on is not particularly interesting and you, it's the first time you've seen it and you're like, that's amazing. And it's like, oh, 20, 20 other people do it. Um, but it's, you know, there's no one better than the other. I think they're both great. And I, all the time, keep my notes. And I'm like, oh, somebody's got to start that company. <laughs> right? Maybe that's me. Um, well, the best way to reach out to you. Best way to reach out to me is send me an email. I want to contour mentors. Dot com. Okay, it, please. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
Um, so, yes. I will. Yeah. So, the second question is a little more, more complicated. Our investment size is we, we are seed, and so we write checks up to, I don't know, you know, million, million and a half, below zero to, you know, that. Um, the how much money you need is the whole thing in and of itself, right? And how long, what milestones, like, that's a conversation, and there is no exact answer to that. You work that out with your investors. I got it. We wouldn't invest. It's a different. It's that. That's part of the, the conversation. Yeah. Um, if you're at like a, a technology based startup, how early is too early to start meeting with? So, here's what. Here's how I would think of it. Think of it as a spectrum where your mother is here and the New York Stock Exchange is here, right? And so, it, depending on where you are, your mother will give you the money no matter what. So you want to sell popsicles, that's cool. You want to do nuclear fusion or quantum computing, that's cool also. She's giving you the money, right? And as you move a little bit further towards the New York Stock Exchange, right, they care less about you, right? And they care more about the business. So you have to sort of manage that in the early days of the business, it should be people you know. They care about you. You don't have the business metrics to show. And nobody has any, you have no credibility in the market, right? Once you start getting a couple of signals, a couple of early indicators that you're onto something, and you have a product, and maybe the team is sort of together, that's a good time to talk to the investors. Okay, so um, an example of a company that uh, we are interested in, and um, so. That I invested in. Sure. So uh, I can talk about the, the IT security company um, and sort of that process, which was a long process, by the way. You know, sometimes it takes a year. Sometimes it takes a really long time to get to know the founders. And they, you know, it's sort of like this drunken sort of like path that sometimes founders take and companies take and they try something out and they don't try something out. So I teach at Columbia uh, in the business school, and one of my students was working on something terrible um, and about five years ago. And, and so he worked on that for a while, and I lost touch, and you know. And about two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I got an email from him, and he said, hey, can I come in and just chat with you? And I said, sure, you know, no problem. And he's like, that other thing that we were working on, it was terrible. And so, um, but in working on that, we actually got to this other thing. And this other thing we think is actually pretty great because we found that it was, again, it was in this medical device sort of space. They found that as they went into the hospitals, they had this huge security issue and that connecting to the network was this big deal and it was super locked down and all of this other thing. And his idea was, why can't we better secure the network and the medical devices as opposed to sort of like working on our own medical device? And so that, you know, was interesting as an idea and how they were going to do it and they didn't know and they just had this sort of, and it probably took six months of back and forth, of coming in, of actually the team wasn't together and he, he and a co-founder who he went to college with was thinking about leaving his job to start this thing and you know and that process you meet with people you get to know them I already knew you know sort of one of the founders already because I had taught him but like you know and it took a good six to nine months to get there to have the team come together to start specking out that there was even a way to do it and that they had some confidence that they actually could do it, and they had to code up a bunch of stuff, and then they had to sort of go into the market and really think about, hey, is this a real need, and do a bunch of that sort of, those conversations. And that was a company though that we funded before certainly any revenue, before even a product. 
which is very rare. But it was such a good idea, and it is such a good idea, and it's proven to be great. Uh, this, this company now, um, we funded it, they did about a million and a half dollar round, we took about half of it, and, um, they, uh, and this company now has eight major, you know, sort of hospital chains that are now sort of deploying, you know, and this is really hard stuff, and, you know, selling into hospitals is hard and slow, and all of those things, and so you really, like, it, it had to be such a compelling proposition to get anybody to move, and to, eight, to get eight hospitals or eight chains to move really fast is a real sort of like uh, testament to sort of how critical the problem was. Yeah? So, with that said, uh, should we get started? Uh, maybe one more question. One more question. Anyone? Yeah? What is the biggest challenge that you had growing your business as an entrepreneur? So, well, I would turn that around to everybody in here. Like, it's all a challenge, right? Let's be real. Like, come on. It's like, you know, hiring and getting to people. And I mean, there's no one thing that's, you know, really, it, it's such a complicated, you know, one of the big things that I certainly took away from one of my last companies, I went into a business where I had no, ex I didn't have a I didn't have a background in it, but I knew that the product was, was useful and necessary, particularly in this area. And it just made it really slow going in the early days to get in touch with people and to understand the intricacies of the dynamics within that industry and whatever. It's super helpful to come out of the industry that you're actually, in, in, in terms of B2B or technology, that you're actually going to go into. And we're just about to fund a company uh, where the founder spent seven years in, in this industry uh, that she's going back to. She has some key insights, and she's building a piece of technology to solve those key insights. And she's been able to get to people like instantaneously because she had a great name and she knew everybody. And you know, and it does. It just makes it so much better, and easier, and fluid. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, so I'm really excited about these next five stars. We're going to come up here and pitch. I think um, Owen may have to write some checks soon to these companies. I'm not going to make the cash joke. I made it already today to him. But uh, our first company is Alex Potepo. It's South Array. And you have four minutes. And let's encourage him maybe or no. Hi. Well, thanks for inviting and uh, thanks for coming in considering the weather. The weather is, wasn't great. I'm uh, uh, from the technical background, I'm a techie. I spent 16 years with IBM. So in case I get carried away into a technical stuff, just wave your hand if you're missing my train of thought. Uh, but I'll try to keep it simple. Um, so what's the format? Do I just, oh yeah, I only have four minutes. So anyway, the, the way the company started that actually is, uh, is quite simple. You all know what the cloud computing is, you know, with all this great success of Amazon, Microsoft, Google, you know, it's all booming and everything. And my friend asked me, uh, say, if Amazon charges $10, can you build a profitable business that charges for the same, just $1? And that got me thinking, well, um, can I, using the same uh, architecture as Amazon, because uh, architecture is simple, you buy hardware, put it in a, in a data center, then you rent it out. So you have to buy hardware, it's expensive, and you have to put it in the data center, so there's an expense involved. And uh, after running different models, I figured probably 250 is the cheapest you can go, you know, if you're not paying any salary, like minimum wage. But then uh, uh, I figured if you change the design completely, you know, if you go from centralized to distributed, you may actually go lower and you may go down to like, you know, half a dollar. And there's also a crazy scenario where, uh, say, uh, I get you connected to the cloud, I give you cloud capacity, and I also pay you. Uh, so let me let me <laughs> just go to the beginning, because uh, it, it does sound crazy. But it, it's, it's an actual working scenario. Uh, so you probably know that the utilization of the servers is not 100%. You, you buy a server, 
and the average utilization is like 20 percent. Uh, so you know, in this building, services are running with 20 percent on average, and in New York City, they're running with 20 percent on average. If you spend a million dollars buying hardware, because I've been selling uh, as well uh, in, in IBM, I mean, I know the scenario. Uh, 80% of your uh, server capacity is not used. So you spend a million dollars on, on the hardware, $800,000 is just wasted. I mean, it's sitting there idle, not doing anything. So uh, it's connected, it's configured, it's uh, running, uh, but it's not really used. It, th this is how business works. I mean, this is not new. It's been like that for years. People oversize it when they buy uh, equipment. They uh, uh, size for the peak capacity and the providers like IBM and others trying to sell more. So now, uh, with all this capacity available, um, okay, with all the capacity available, we figured how about we build a cloud computing based on this capacity. Instead of buying hardware, instead of building data centers, we want to build a, um, a hybrid cloud out of this available capacity. So uh, basically, by reconnecting your uh, existing hardware into a cloud, uh, we might save you like 10 or 20 times because we're using your waste. And also, uh, uh, in our design, uh, anybody can be a provider, you can sell your excess capacity to the marketplace. It will not be $10 per unit, but you will get some money back uh, for, uh, the serv for the hardware that you already bought. So basically, the idea is we, yes, we give uh, uh, Clients a hybrid cloud, by the way, it's a native. No? Ten seconds. Well, thanks for listening. In case you have questions. So, I have a couple of sort of macro things to say about it. So, one question, and is this QA or is this. Okay, but one question that I would have for you why do you think this doesn't exist? Well, do you know any hybrid cloud provider? I do. Um, so historically, I can tell you that this has been tried in many different areas. Okay. And so one important thing to think about this idea is that you have to assume intelligence. You have to assume that there are smart people like you who have had similar ideas and have tried to leverage this. And you know there are, there was a very high profile company in New York called Data Synapse, which I don't know if anybody knows about or not, which actually tried exactly this years ago, uh, as the internet was sort of like you know dawning and, and whatnot. And you've also got a, you know there are a couple of blockchain sort of like initiatives that are underway now with tokens in terms of storage and compute and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. These ideas have not really worked because they're not solving a customer problem, they're solving a different problem, right? So my problem as a customer is the thing that you really should focus on, right? Okay. You're, and if I want to sort of look at and be provided a service, right, is Amazon truly too expensive for me, right? It may be, right? Well, on the other hand, right, if I own a server, right, I'm not the customer, right? You need to be focused on the customer not the person that owns the server. Okay, I mean, I can pitch it from the customer perspective and the customer problem. Uh, uh, say you're an average business, middle size. You have an existing hardware, and you already bought some public cloud service. Everybody, yeah. I mean, 90% sure. did. So you're using some Amazon. The problem now, the Amazon is not compatible with your stuff. Whatever they have is one environment, and whatever you have on premises is different sure. your, your standard problem is now you have to integrate the both. Some, most likely you will go and shop for some hybrid solution. Okay. You will have an integration piece in the middle. I got it. We'll so remove the complexity. So maybe one of the things to yeah. point out when you pitch this or when you work on this more is that you are the integration layer mm -hmm. uh, at the hybrid level as opposed to this sort of shared resource issue, mm -hmm. right? The important thing may be that you are able to seamlessly move, right, applications, data, whatever it may be, between my home environment and right. my cloud environment. And that's yeah. a different value proposition than saying we're going to basically build clouds over everybody's, you know, sort of like extra hardware and, and compute cycles and whatnot. Right. We give you one environment, your on-premise becomes the cloud. I think that may be the thing to most focus on. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've checked with one person. 
about elevator pitch, and I said, well, this is one way of pitching it from the top level, and there's a problem. He said, problem is too technical. Yeah. But also, uh, there is about ideas and time. Uh, you might have an idea about the cloud computing back in the 70s, but you need to wait until 2006 like Amazon did because you need to have certain network speed globally. I understand. And I think for the distributed uh, architecture, you, you also need the, the current speed. I mean, it wouldn't work five years ago. I, I think on this one, you have to assume some level of intelligence. And if I were you, I would go and find all of the founders that worked on these sort of spare cycle companies and go interview them and try to figure out that actually why it didn't. Because as you know, none of them work because nobody does that, right? Well, um, again, I mean, I think it's just a timing issue as well. One thing is if you connect it with a gigabit, like, you know, nowadays you can get a gigabit connection to a network. The other thing, if it's like 50 megabit, you know, 10 years ago, and uh, there's a good chance it didn't work because it just wasn't ready for that. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thank